so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters this podcast was recorded on. It's December 1978, and the Des Plaines police in Chicago are desperately trying to find a missing 15-year-old boy. Robert Peast was last seen at his part-time job at a local pharmacy, and there's one person in particular they're keen to chat to. 36-year-old John Wayne Gacy had been at the store on the day in question. The local businessman had been chatting to Robert about a job at his construction company. He hired lots of local teenage boys. As investigators looked into him, his criminal history piqued their interest. This guy had done time for sodomy of a teenage boy a decade ago in another state. The parallels were there. They needed to find out more. But Gacy was dodging them. So they were in the process of putting the heat on. They were watching his house. They were following him. They were demanding he come to the station for questioning. They were organising a search warrant for his house. They were turning up at his work, at the coffee shop he was dining at, at his friends' homes. When police finally gain access to his ranch-style property on West Summerdale Avenue, they're immediately suspicious. Found books that talking about gay boys must die, I think was one of the titles. We found some sex toys, some torture toys. We found chains, handcuffs, also a high school classroom from Maine West High School. It had a initials JAS on them. Then they find the crawl space underneath his house. At first, they don't see anything, but then detectives notice a putrid odour. Eventually, with police breathing down his neck, Gacy starts talking. Well, do you want me to rationalise it and explain it to you? Okay. It's Greyhound bus boy is number one. I believe I stabbed him a couple of times. Four or five times in the chest. Turns out John Wayne Gacy didn't just kill Robert Peast. As he tells police in a sprawling, sickening confession, those in the room will later call the worst day of their lives, Gacy is very detailed in his admissions. I've been the judge, jury and executioner of many, many people, he tells them. I'm Gemma Bath, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. John Wayne Gacy is one of the worst serial killers in American history, murdering at least 33 teenage boys and men in the late 1970s. He became known as the Killer Clown because of his affinity to dress up like one. He was executed by lethal injection in 1994, but many, including today's guest, are confident he killed even more victims than the ones he admitted to and took plenty more secrets to the grave. Gacy's crimes are the stuff of true nightmares. He would lure his victims, young boys and men, to his Chicago home on the promise of construction work or some other ruse. Then he would torture them in unfathomable ways, sexually and physically, before murdering them. And a warning, we do delve more into the details of exactly what he subjected his victims to later in this podcast. With so many victims, it's easy to think of the numbers rather than the names in this story. The sheer amount of young lives lost to this monster. Like 16-year-old Timothy Jack McCoy... 14-year-old Samuel Stapleton, 17-year-old Michael Bonin, 20-year-old John Prestige, and 18-year-old Robert Gilroy. That was just five names. Gacy murdered six times that, stuffing their bodies into the crawl space of his house before he ran out of room and moved onto other areas of his property and a nearby river. 
Today's guest has met Gacy in the flesh numerous times. She was his lawyer while he was on death row and has written a book, Killing Time, with John Wayne Gacy, defending America's most evil serial killer on death row. Karen Conti joins us now. Karen, can you give us a bit of a background? Where were you when the Gacy story and his crimes were unfolding? And then how did you come to be involved in the case itself, you know, years and years later? Gacy was committing these crimes in the 1970s in a suburb of Chicago. And he was arrested in 1979. Well, I was in high school at that time. I was a senior in high school. And I remember the story because it was the most amazing story in the world. Like there was one body, then there were five bodies being brought out, then people were taking bets. And all in all, there were 33 bodies, 27 that buried under his house and on his property and another four that were discarded in the river. I mean, it was a turning point in your life because as a teenager, you didn't understand what that was. And it was a different time too. We didn't know what a pedophile was. We didn't know a lot about serial killers. And this was a guy who was a very successful construction worker. He was high up in the political party. He did charitable work. He entertained kids at parties. This was a guy who no one suspected. So flash ahead 14 years, he's been convicted. He's been sentenced to death. And now I've gone to college and law school, and I've been a lawyer for just a few years when we get the call in my office that Gacy wants to interview me and my law partner about representing him. Wow. There is a lot there to unpack. So let's fill in a few of the details. I want to go back to the start, John's childhood. He seems to have had a pretty rough time with his dad, right, which kind of sets the scene for his life, really. This is the big question. What created John Wayne Gacy, right? Because nobody is born evil, I don't believe. And Gacy had a hard upbringing, but not as hard as you would imagine. And his father was an alcoholic and his father was verbally and physically abusive to him. His mother was very loving but passive. But that really wasn't unusual back in the 40s and 50s. That dynamic was present in a lot of homes that didn't result in a John Wayne Gacy being created. But I think there were some other things too, Gemma. I think that Gacy grew up in a very strict Catholic environment. And I think at an early age, he was sexually abused a couple of times. And he probably knew that he was either homosexual or bisexual. That was very confusing to him because back at those days, we didn't know what that was. And it wasn't acceptable, especially given the Catholic upbringing. So if you have that combination of all of those things, I think that might explain a little bit about why John Wayne Gacy became what he became. I think that's a very important area to delve into, homosexuality in the 1970s. Completely different story to now. People just weren't out. You couldn't be. Right. And, you know, think about this. John Wayne was a macho cowboy in the movies back in the 40s, right? And his father named him after this macho cowboy. And here he was, a kid who didn't like sports, didn't like going hunting and fishing. He liked cooking and he liked gardening. And he just didn't match up with what his father wanted him to be. And that combination, the shrinks will tell you, kind of led him to maybe kill himself over and over again when he was killing these young men and boys. You kind of painted the picture before, but I want to go into it a bit more. From the outside, adult John was a very successful and kind of well-known guy. He had a very successful construction company. He dabbled in politics. Can you take us more into that? Because he was a real good guy in quotation marks. He was helping the community. Right. I mean, he had a construction company and in today's dollars, he would have been earning over $400,000 a year. And for someone who didn't go to college, that was a lot of money. He was very successful. He built franchises for ice cream parlors and drugstores. He did home remodeling. He employed a bunch of people. He also lived in a very nice neighborhood. It was modest, but it was very nice. And he was in politics. He served on different boards. He went to political functions. He raised money for candidates. And he volunteered at his church. He went to church. He was very hardworking. 
His neighbors loved him. He would shovel their snow and mow their lawns. He was very well respected in the community. And he was the guy who everyone said we had no idea. And they almost didn't believe it until the proof came out. As part of painting that picture, I think visuals are really important. What did he look like? Did he look like a scary guy? Not at all. And that's one of the things that I have to tell you is more frightening than if he had looked like a scary individual. He was about five foot nine, kind of pudgy. By the time I met him, he was very pale from all the years that he had spent in prison. But there was nothing imposing about him. There was nothing unusual about him. He was very average looking. And if you think about it, if he did look like evil or if he did act like evil, he probably wouldn't have gotten away with 33 murders. It probably would have been one and done. He wasn't one of those guys walking around muttering. He was a socially appropriate, glib, funny, engaging human being. And that's how we got away with murder. We've talked about how he was likely homosexual or at least bisexual, but he did marry women and had children and by all accounts seemed to enjoy family life for a moment there. He did. He was married twice and he loved his wives and his wives loved him. And they had normal sex until he didn't really care to do it anymore with them. And that was what caused the breakup of both marriages. And yes, he had children and he liked living that suburban life of the hardworking businessman who came home to dinner with his family and children. And, you know, at some point that just became not as important to him as the murder and the torture and the burying the boys. Obviously, it escalated to murder, but it did start with, you know, a lot of sexual abuses, sexual assaults, things like manipulation, blackmail. Can you take us through what he was doing in those early years behind the scenes, how he was tricking almost teenagers to have sex with him? Well, before he moved to Chicago, back to Chicago, I should say, He lived for a while in Iowa, which is a state next to Illinois, and he was married and his wife's family owned Kentucky Fried Chickens. And so he was the manager at two of them, which was another really good job and very lucrative. But while he was there, he assaulted one of his employees and assaulted another one as well. And for that, he was charged with some crimes, sex crimes and extortion because he tried to get people to testify on his behalf. So he did serve some time there in Iowa. And when he was released on parole and came to Chicago, that's when he started killing in earnest. And my thought is that he knew now that he couldn't leave witnesses and that he now had to kill the people who he was forcing sex on. That sodomy charge you mentioned, he was sentenced to 10 years but only ended up serving two. How did that happen? Well, he was a model prisoner. I think he was JC of the year, which is kind of a civic honor. And he did all kinds of things in prison. He helped paint the prison. He helped cook. He you know, did what John Gacy was really good at, and that is fitting in, doing good deeds, getting people to trust him, and manipulating the system. And in our country at that time, if you did show those types of things, you were able to get a better deal. But really, it is astounding because even the psychiatrists who examined him at the time said that John Gacy would never change and that he would always pose a threat to society. And they were right. So he was released in 1970. His first wife left him took the kids, he starts all over again in Chicago and he buys this huge house, which becomes important later. Can you talk us through the house? Because it was it was quite a, a beautiful property, wasn't it? It was. I mean, I wouldn't call it a mansion, but it was in a very nice suburb close to Chicago. Houses were pretty close to each other, which is astounding if you think about what went on in that house of horrors. But he kept the house very nicely maintained, you know, mowed the lawn. I mean, everything was picture perfect. He had a pool table and a basement where he would invite people over. He had huge parties. And it was sort of like the central meeting place for neighbors and friends. So we know he had a second wife. They lived in that house together with her two daughters from another marriage for a little while. And then they divorced. And so he was alone in this house. But beneath it all, he was still 
back to his old ways, back to the reason he went to prison in the first place. He was still kind of preying on young boys this whole time, wasn't he? He was. And, you know, we'll never know exactly what happened before the crimes that he was convicted of occurred, but he had a penchant for young men who were prostitutes. I do want to say this, the victims that Gacy killed were not all prostitutes. Some of them just wanted a job with him and they would come to his house and apply for a job and then they would never be seen again. Some of them he tricked into coming to his house and ended up killing them. But many of them were prostitutes or runaways who he knew weren't going to be missed and he would go and pick them up at the bus station or at a certain park where it was a known meeting place for gay people at the time. So he was dabbling in these things. And then I think it escalated. I think he needed more and more to meet his fantasies and the fantasies just got on fire. And so he needed more torture. He needed more murder. He needed to keep those young men and boys near him on that property. Before we get more into the murders, I want to talk about the clown club that he joined in 1975. It feels like something that was written into a horror movie. But talk about clowning, how he got into that, what he kind of used that for. Well, I talk about this in my book, and not to get too deep into somebody who likes to dress up as a clown, but he never picked up any of his victims as a clown. A lot of people think that. But no, no, Gacy would never have been able to do that in that creepy setting. He did it in plain clothes. But what he did do is he liked to dress up as a clown. He went to hospitals and he went to parades and things like that. Although, frankly, no one has ever verified that he did anything like that. But he said that he did over the years. I think what he was doing was putting on the costume to hide who he was. He was a dark person with very dark fantasies that he acted upon. And I think this was his way of making himself into some sort of invisible person so he could be what he really wanted to be. It's sort of like when you go to a masquerade party, you see people doing things they would never normally do because they have a mask on. I think that's how Gacy looked at it. He wanted to do these evil things, but he didn't want to do them in his plain clothes. So this was his way of masking that. Well, it kind of checks out because before murdering these men and boys, he often did a bit of a performance and some tricks. Can you talk us through that? It's horrific. He had a set of handcuffs and he told the boys, hey, you want to see a handcuff trick? And the kids would invariably say yes. He would put the handcuffs on himself and then he released himself and he'd say, well, that's a good trick, isn't it? Now you try it. So they put the handcuffs on themselves. Gacy would clasp them. And he said, the trick is now you can't get out. And that's when he'd start to torture them. So very sick, very, very sick and sadistic. And that's what makes Gacy one of the worst serial killers, not just in number, but in how he took pleasure in really torturing these boys. How long did he torture these men and boys before murdering them? This was all happening in this house that we talked about before. I think some of the torture went on for hours, according to accounts Gacy did not necessarily talk to me about any of this stuff because by the time I represented him, he wasn't talking about his crimes at all. But he did talk to a lawyer early on who he recounted some of these things. And just from the facts, you could see that he really took his time in torturing them. Can you elaborate, and it's a horrible area to delve in, but to give people an idea of just how sick this man was, What kind of torture was he putting these people through? What was he doing to them? How was he murdering them? It was a variety of things. He had a torture board where he would strap them to the board and he would sodomize them repeatedly and sodomize them with various objects. He would sometimes put them in a bathtub and he would drown them until they almost passed out. And then he would revive them and sodomize them again and do the same thing over and over again. So it was a variety of things. It was horrific. It was certainly geared toward watching them suffer. That was part of his sexual pleasure. And finally, you know, he would end up killing them usually by strangling them or using a rope around their neck. 
he did say that he found out through the process that death was the ultimate thrill, which gives you kind of an idea. It's impossible to rationalize any of this because the idea that sex and violence is somehow related, most of us say that doesn't make any sense. In fact, it's the opposite. You couldn't even imagine that. But to a person like Gacy and the Gacy's of the world, somehow, somewhere, they've had a fantasy about hurting other people. And that fantasy somehow got caught up with sexuality. And that sexual conduct could not even happen unless there was violence attended to it. So this doesn't happen overnight. This happens over a period of time. And whether it was a combination of Gacy's brain having some problems he had two violent head injuries during his childhood that could have contributed to his lack of remorse and impulse control. And also all the things we talked about, a father who was abusive and he was angry and he was not in control because his father was hitting him and doing all these things and then being sexually abused. I think all of these things fed in to this dark fantasy that just evolved over time to the point where it kept escalating and escalating to what we finally saw. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Barth. I'm speaking with defence attorney and author Karen Conti about American serial killer John Wayne Gacy. Up next, we talk about the souvenirs Gacy kept from his victims and how he was eventually caught. There were quite a few boys that actually escaped. Why didn't that lead to his arrest at the time? Again, let's look at the time that this occurred. We didn't have those databases that were all connected with our different states and our different counties. So it was difficult for the police to pull up Gacy's name and see that he had served time in another state. It just wasn't part of the system at the time. Also, Gacy was very prominent, and no one would have suspected that he was doing any of these things. And I would add a third thing to this, and that is that when the boys reported these things to the police, I think the police looked the other way thinking, oh, they're gay, so we don't really have to take any action because it was between two people we really don't care about in that regard. That was the time. That was definitely in the 1970s. There was a whole different attitude toward the homosexual population. But again, it's hard to believe there was one victim who got away. He was horribly, horribly injured by Gacy, injured for life by the torture that Gacy was perpetrating. He goes running out of there. He calls the police. He gets the police to arrest Gacy. They arrest Gacy. Then they drop the charges. And this happened over and over again. Even some of the boys who tried to get a job with Gacy, they were last seen going up to his house and they would ask Gacy, where'd this kid go? And he'd say, oh, I don't know. I never saw him or he was a runaway. Or So there were so many opportunities to catch Gacy at this stuff, but it just never happened and didn't happen soon enough. At the time, did it influence the way that Chicago and and young men felt? Was there terror? Was there fear on the streets? I think there was a turning point when Gacy was arrested. I don't think anyone had ever seen anything like this or suspected anything like this was going on. And it was sort of a loss of innocence. And I remember even thinking to myself, Stranger Danger, remember we saw that movie in school and I didn't even understand what that meant. I mean, I understood that you didn't take candy from strangers or get in their car, but I didn't have any idea what that person could have done to me. And I think this was a wake up call because I think children, this is a different time. We were much more innocent. We didn't have social media. We didn't have newspapers that printed graphic things. So we were very sheltered from this kind of thing. I think we started asking questions of our parents. You know, what does it mean to be a serial killer? What does it mean to be abducted? What does it mean to torture? I mean, we were asking those questions and our parents, you know, were forced to try to answer them. So yeah, I think this was a turning point. I think that the gay community was terrified of what happened. And there's always a story about someone who escaped or worked for Gacy and just got away in time or was almost picked up at a bar and, and knew who Gacy was. And so, so many people escaped with their lives that I think this was just terrifying to the whole community. I want to touch a little bit more on his psychology, the way he would talk about this. I know he didn't talk about it with you, but there's been people he has spoken about it to and it's been 
reported on a lot over the years. And I think it's the phrasing that he used that really gets to me. So things like he'd talk about cruising and that was how he would like get around town looking for boys and he would call it I'm going cruising or things like there were some nights that he would murder multiple people and he would call them, you know, doubles. It's like the way he spoke about people and murder. Yeah, he had this notebook that had all the pictures of all the victims and their high school pictures and the pictures of their house and maybe their dog and an article about when they went missing. And I looked at it and I said, where did you get this? And he said, I paid somebody to compile it. And on the front of this book, it was called the body book. And I said to him, John, bodies, these are human beings. These are boys. These are men. He said, yeah, well, you know, and he shrugged his shoulders as if to say, no, they're not. And this is the most chilling thing about Gisi is that he dehumanized them. He completely dehumanized those victims and almost blamed them. And he would say things like, where were their parents when they were out at night? Why did they get in a car with somebody? And how did they end up, you know? So he'd say these things as if to blame them for what he did to them. That body book, had he shown anyone that before he showed it to you? I think so. He paid a lot of money while he was in prison to have a private investigator compile all this stuff. And remember, this was before the internet. This is when you had to go to the newspaper and go through microfiche and find these things and photocopy them. So this was a lot of work that was done to put this together. And, you know, I was just asking him, why did you do this? He'd say, well, I have to figure out why all these people were under my house. Maybe I can make a connection, which was completely trash. That was a huge lie. I think he wanted to keep that as souvenirs of of his killings that he was proud of. On souvenirs, he also collected those at the time of the murders, didn't he? Like in his house. He did. And there the police found, you know, a cache of school rings and driver's licenses and possessions of some of his victims, which is really sad. We did touch on it briefly, but can you tell us more about what he did with the bodies because he kept them all in his house and then when he outgrew a space he looked for other places to bury these people right there was a crawl space under his house and he buried them in a very neat pattern and in fact when he was arrested and he confessed to the crimes he had an amazing memory not only of the names of most of them where he abducted them approximately when this happened, and then also where the bodies were. And he actually drew a little chart showing how the bodies were lined up down there. It was just chilling. And then you're right, he ran out of real estate. So he buried some in his yard. And then when he ran out of space there, he threw four of them in the nearby river. The murder of Robert Pierce was his undoing in the end. Robert was a teenager. Tell us about how he was finally caught, because it was quite a process, wasn't it? It was. Robert Peast was a beautiful young man. He wanted to get a job with John Gacy, so Rob's mother drove him to a drugstore where Gacy was working. The mother was celebrating her birthday that night. Rob was supposed to apply for the job, get back in the car. They were going to go home and have a birthday dinner. That was the last time his mother ever saw him going into that drugstore. Within an hour, Gacy had taken him home, raped him, killed him, and put him in the crawl space. So this was his undoing because the mother said, I know where he was going. I know what he was doing. You've got to go to Gacy's house. And the police did, and the rest was history. They smelled some horrible things in the house. They followed him for a while, and so they finally arrested him and charged him. But he actually confessed in the end as well, didn't he? He did. And I think at the time, my understanding from the lawyer who heard the confession was that Gacy was very stressed out by this lifestyle he was leading. He was working long hours at his business, taking all kinds of drugs and drinking copious amounts of alcohol. Then he was going out at night and killing one, two, or sometimes three young men abducting them, taking them back, torturing them, killing them, then going out for a second one. So this was very stressful to him. I can't even imagine what that's like. And it was almost as if he were relieved 
that he finally was able to say, I'm done with this. I'm not going to do it anymore. And I'm going to tell you all about it. So he went to trial in February 1980 on 33 murder charges. Was anything about his state of mind revealed in that process? I think the question that always comes up when you have a serial killer like this is, are they mad or just bad? Right. Well, he did lodge the insanity defense. And in our country, the insanity defense is a very difficult defense to prove. And here's why. To succeed on the insanity defense, you need to prove that the defendant had some sort of mental illness or condition. The second part is that that mental illness or condition had to have caused the defendant not to understand the actions that he was taking and whether they were right or wrong. So if you think about it, anyone who does this kind of killing, you say, right, he's got to be out of his mind. But Gacy knew to bury them. He knew to hide them. He knew he couldn't be caught. So clearly he knew what was right and wrong. And that's where the defense fails. And that's where his defense failed. Yes. So he was found guilty on all charges. Correct. And that was an American record at the time, wasn't it? It was absolutely a world record. And he was sentenced to death. He spent 14 years on death row, and that's where you come in to the story. Tell us a bit more about when that phone call came through to your company and how the decision was made to send you. Was that your decision? Did you put your hand up? Well, at that time, all of his traditional appeals had been exhausted, and so he did not have a right to counsel at this point in time. So when my partner and I had argued a case before the United States Supreme Court several years before on a First Amendment issue. And it was a kind of a prominent case, and it got a lot of press. And so we were kind of known as First Amendment lawyers, even though we hadn't handled a lot of the cases, we still had that reputation. So Gacy had some First Amendment litigation that was going on. The prison was suing him over money that he was earning by painting, and Gacy wanted us to defend him in that case which was ridiculous because here he is he having seven months left to live and he's worried about civil lawsuits for money damages. But I said to my partner, we have to go down and meet him. I want to know what it looks like. I want to know what it looks like to look evil in the eye. And it was just my curiosity. I didn't think we were going to represent him. I had no idea we were going to represent him in the death penalty aspect I just wanted to go to death row and have that experience. And that's the reason we went out. Tell me about that day. Talk me through how you were feeling and what it was like even getting into the prison in the first place and then sitting across a table with John Wayne Gacy. Well, it's a long way from Chicago. It's six and a half hours south of Chicago. So it goes into this rural area in Illinois along the Mississippi River. And it's this big old prison that's one of the most dangerous prisons in the country. And death row is even more dangerous because all of those people there are committed at least one murder, if not multiple murders, and have nothing left to lose. So we get in there, and as a woman in a prison, you get a lot of unwanted attention, I'll just say, which I was used to at that time. So you know, we finally make our way into death row, which is in the middle of this horrible prison, And I realized that when you go in to see and visit a prisoner, at least at this place, that you're not behind a plexiglass window, as you see in the movies. You are in there with all the other serial killers and psychotic killers who are walking around free range with their visitors. So it's very, very intimidating. And again, there's a little bit of honor among criminals in that we were there to save Gacy's life according to what they might have thought. So they probably were going to leave us alone because they wanted our help. And they knew that if Gacy went down and was executed, that they would be next. So there's a little bit of honor there. But, you know, you just know that the guards who are on the other side of the door, the locked door, aren't probably going to get there in time if you needed help. So it was a little intimidating to walk into that room. That doesn't feel safe, Karen. No, it probably wasn't safe, but that's the way it was. And I will say this, Gacy didn't frighten me. I mean, I had read a lot about him over the years. I had read a lot of the books that were written about him. I've always been very fascinated by true crime. So I did know my John Gacy story. 
And I knew that he was the type of killer who was very compartmentalized. He lived this life, as we talked about, that was like upstanding and religious and political. And, and then he did these horrible, heinous crimes. But I knew he could control himself. And frankly, I wasn't his type. So I knew that I wasn't going to be a victim of John Gacy because he needed something from me. And, and sociopaths are nothing but manipulative. So he needed something from us and he was going to try to get it. But the other people on death row were not all that way. There were some of them who literally were psychotic, psychotic when they committed the crimes and really were not compartmentalized and maybe didn't have that filter that Gacy did. So what did he say to you when you first got there? What did he want to talk about first up? Was he polite? Absolutely. He was inviting us into his home. How are you doing? How was your trip? You know, how is the weather out there? Where's your office? And where are you from? And so, yeah, he was engaging. He, he was a conversationalist. He was funny. He was glib. Yeah, everything normal, just like you're meeting your favorite uncle. So you said you went there not with the intention to really represent him, but you did end up representing him. How did that happen and what did you do for him or try and do for him? Well, as I said, he wanted us to represent him in the civil matter. And when we went down there, we had no preconceived notions about what we were going to do. In fact, what we thought we were going to do is nothing, not represent him. We just wanted the experience. But when my partner and I left the prison, I realized that they're going to execute this guy. And I have always been against the death penalty, even from the time I was a young kid. My parents were both in favor of it. I was not. I used to have arguments with people about it. I'd never done anything about it. I'd never represented anyone. I never thought I would represent someone on death row. But I said to myself, I should take on the death penalty part of this and help out because once Gacy's executed, then there are going to be other people who are going to be executed who might have defenses like actual innocence or racist prosecution or poor counsel because of their income level. All of those things play into getting into the death penalty. Gacy had none of those defenses, but I thought it was important to stand up against the death penalty, use Gacy as a way to say it's wrong even for that evil person, put him in jail, throw away the key. I'm not saying release him, but just don't execute him because it's barbaric. That was my thought. And so that's what we did. We volunteered to join the death penalty team who was already representing Gacy. There were two very good death penalty lawyers and my law partner and I made four on the team. And what was that experience like? It was seven months of constant activity, coming up with appeals, going into courts. We were up and down the court system to the Supreme Court, to the state Supreme Court, to the federal court. We were seeing Gacy on a regular basis to talk to him about strategy down on death row, on the phone with him constantly. Obviously, the press was wildly interested in this story. We hadn't executed somebody in Illinois for a long period of time. And so the press was just fascinated by the whole process. And so it was just a whirlwind of legal and press activity. be a strange word to use, but did you enjoy that experience professionally or did it take a toll on you being so close and talking so often with a man like this that had done such horrible things? I wouldn't say that I enjoyed the process while it happened. It did give me some very good skills. And so it taught me about resilience. It taught me about standing up in the face of your detractors. It taught me how to speak to the media. It taught me a lot of good things, but as a lot of things in life are, you know, when you're going through it, it's not fun, but then you look back and you say, wow, that was a game changer. That turned the whole my whole life around. And as far as talking to Gacy, a lot of people ask me that question. Did it make you feel horrible? And did it make you feel dirty? And did you see that evil side? Truth of the matter is he didn't act that way with me. Okay. He did not act in an evil way. I didn't see the darkness in him. I knew it was there. But I didn't see it. And so in one way, that was chilling because I thought to myself, I know what Gacy did, but he's not showing this to me. So what does that mean as to all the other people I know in my life? Who else is out there 
who is doing something like this are capable of this kind of cruelty and is fooling us all. That's what frightened me more than anything. Did it get to the point where you were on friendly basis? Was he like, oh, hey, Karen, how was your day? Like that kind of vibe? He was. You can't be friends with a sociopath because they're really a shell of a person. There's no there there. They don't have a conscience. They're not integrated. So they say what they think that you want to hear. They're always manipulating and charming and trying to get something that they want. So it's hard to be friends with somebody like that. I would not say I was friends with Gacy. Was I friendly with Gacy? Absolutely, because I had to do my job. And interestingly, because Gacy and I had a very different relationship than the other men on the team, I was able to get him to agree to do things that the other lawyers just couldn't get him to agree to do. He was very confrontational, very oppositional, With the men, it was hard for him to agree to anything, but I was able to talk to him and run some of his objections and kind of get the things done that I needed to get done, which made me valuable to the team in a very strange way. We know that you weren't successful in getting him off death row. He was put to death. You mentioned that Gacy stopped talking about his crimes near the end. Did he show any remorse? No, there was no remorse. He denied that he did these crimes. He said the first one was self-defense. He had no idea how those boys got on his basement. He was just in denial. He was a liar and he didn't want to talk about it. I would ask him questions just to see if I could get something from him. I would say to him, John, maybe if you talk about some of this, maybe we can buy you some extra time. Maybe you can give some comfort to some of these victims, families in some way but he was not remorseful and just denied that he did it all. He was executed in 1994, but it didn't exactly go to plan. What was that day like? It took them a long time to finally put him to death, about 45 minutes. And as you see, even in the current news, there are botched executions all over the place. And it's really common to have botched executions because you can't have a doctor administer lethal injection because of their Hippocratic Oath. They can't be part of basically killing somebody. So so you see these prison guards who don't really know what they're doing, can't find veins because of drug use or because the defendant is cold, and these things clog, and it's just a disaster. Were you there when he died? I was not allowed to be there. There was a lottery, and some of the media were allowed to be there, but I was not. Would you have wanted to be, though? I did want to be there. In fact, I was actually angling to do that. I I thought to myself, you know, we're entitled to lawyers at every step of the way during after the arrest, during the trial, during the appeals. And why not at the end, the most important thing, you're taking a human life and the government is doing it. You think you would be entitled to have a lawyer, but that's not the law in our state. I did want to be there to experience it. Do you think Gacy died holding a lot more secrets under his belt than we know about? Because I I have heard a lot of talk about there possibly being accomplices to some of his murders. Yes, I believe he took secrets to his grave. I believe there were probably more victims, and I do believe that he had people helping him perpetrate the crimes, procure the victims, and burying the bodies. Do you think that they were some of these young men that he might have manipulated? Or is it something more sinister? Was it a co-conspirator? I think there were young men who worked for him. A couple of them actually lived with him for a while. And it's impossible for me to believe that Gacy was doing all of these murders and they had no clue what was going on. Two of them testified against Gacy that they dug the crawl spaces. And again, They said they didn't know why they were digging the crawl spaces. It's impossible for me to believe, number one, that they didn't know that. Number two, they didn't hear or see or smell any of the the stuff that was going on. And number three, Gacy couldn't have gotten down in those crawl spaces because he was just so portly. It just doesn't make sense that he was able to get down there the way he would have had to get, get down there and carried a body. It just doesn't make any sense. There were more people involved, I'm convinced. Thanks to Karen for assisting us to tell this story. If you would like to read more about this case, 
You can find her book, Killing Time with John Wayne Gacy, representing America's most evil serial killer on death row, linked in our episode description. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast, hosted and produced by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Scott Stronick. Our executive producer is Gia Moylan. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another True Crime Conversation.